President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, students, welcome once again to Georgetown School of Foreign Service in Tatar. Um, for His Excellency, it's the first visit, but hopefully not the last. Um, and it's a special privilege. One always says this when there are distinguished visitors, of course, but this is really a special privilege. Uh, it's not often one gets a president of a, of a state to visit, and it's even more exceptional for that president to be a fellow scholar of the very subjects that we study and teach and research here at Georgetown in Qatar. So this is an extraordinary combination, and, and the privilege and the pleasure of receiving you here is, uh, is all the greater. Um, so that, that, that doubles my, um, uh, my commitment to try and make sure that this is not the last time you visit us. Um, and there is a, a little footnote which I've shared with His Excellency already this morning, which gives me uh, an, an additional little um, lift to, to, in receiving you here and in, in introducing this, uh, this event. And that is that I remember with very, very great fondness my first visit to Macedonia um, just at the time it was being recognized by the United Nations. And um, the, this was an academic event that I was involved in, but the atmosphere and the people and the food um, were out of this world. So that's always stayed with me. Now, we have a tradition here that um, we have one of our very own students introduce our most distinguished speaker, uh, speakers. And the introduction in this case is going to be uh, done by Amir uh, Hasanovic of the class of 2014, who is a, what we call a junior here, um, and who is himself, of course, Macedonian. So, Amir. Thank you, Dean Onim. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, respected professors, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Amir Hasanovic, a junior student coming from Skopje, Macedonia, studying international politics here at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Today, I have the great pleasure and privilege of introducing to you Dr. Georgi Ivanov current president of the Republic of Macedonia. President Ivanov is a graduate of the law faculty at St. Cyrilus and Methodius University in Skopje, where he also earned his master's degree in political science with the thesis, Civil Society, New Contradictions of an Old Debate, as well as his PhD on Democracy and Divided Societies, the case of Macedonia. Our distinguished guest in his early career was an editor of the Macedonian National Television in 1988. But after receiving his PhD, he commenced a career in the world of academia. He was a professor of political theory and political philosophy at the law faculty in Skopje, as well as a visiting professor to the Southeast Europe program at the University of Athens, Greece in 1999. President Ivanov is a leading expert in civil society research and scholarship in Macedonia. In addition, he is the co-founder of the first Macedonian political science journal, Political Opinion, the founder and honorary president of the Macedonian Political Science Association. He is also credited with the inception of the Institute for Democracy, Solidarity and Civil Society, a prominent Macedonian think tank. President Ivanov is here to speak to us about a topic of considerable relevance to us students of international relations, bridging two crossroads of civilizations, the Balkans and the Gulf. For me personally, it's an especially important day in my academic career. Today, my ambition and efforts are united. My ambition to lead and shape a multi-ethnic society the way President Ivanov has, and my efforts to hone my abilities in doing so here at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, Qatar. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest, current president of the Republic of Macedonia, Dr. Georgi Ivanov.
At the very beginning, I would like to wish welcome to all of you. My address will be in Macedonian. Uh, sometimes the questions like the question of the Gulf and the Balkans cannot be explained except in the mother tongue. So, for the beginning, there are so many definitions regarding the Balkans, as there are many uh, definitions for the Gulf as well. In all encyclopedia, Balkans has always uh, been connected to ethnic division, conflict, intolerance. It is a place where constant conflicts between the communities living in the same area happen. Although we use the definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica and also from the Webster uh, Dictionary, it is always mentioned that the Balkan is a place of conflict, of violence, and the term Balkanization is used for the Middle East, for the Near East, for Syria, for Sudan, for Pakistan, everywhere there are ethnic, religious conflicts. It's this term, the term Balkanization is being used. However, this is a definition from others, how they perceive the Balkans. So, the others have given the definitions for the Gulf as well. You will find it as a Persian Gulf, as Arabic Gulf, or only the Gulf. It is very important to learn about the Balkans and, and for the Gulf by our own, whether there is a self-reflection, a self-definition for the Balkans. This was an attempt by an uh, U.S. Uh, Professor Maria Todorova uh, in the book uh, Thinking of uh, the Balkans and uh, also this was done by Edward Seitz, uh, the book Orientalism, uh, who introduced a new perception of the situation in uh, the Balkans and uh, the situation in the Middle East, in the Gulf. Uh, when you're being defined by the others, uh, they use uh, too many stereotypes, prejudice, and fears. So, for the Balkans, it is called that it is a, a barrel, of, a casket of barrel. That uh, the Balkan is the place where the Homo Balkanicus lives. That the term Balkanization is a negative term. Uh, Maria Todorova and the other authors uh, dedicated to uh, researching this issue and defining the situation in the Balkans. They say that uh, if uh, the ba if the Balkans is uh, the barrel of uh, powder, then uh, the ignition has never been on the Balkans, that uh, the Balkan has other issues uh, that might not be seen by the others. The same goes to the Near East and the Gulf. So, the Balkan is a place where uh, different civilizations get into contact, where different cultures merge, where different religions meet. So, the Balkans is the gate uh, to the Europe and also it is the uh, door from Europe to Asia. You will also see that Europe has received its name from the uh, Near East because it is a Phoenician princess which was in relation with Zeus, who was taken to uh, Crete, and that's where the name Europe has started been using. And also the civilization, the European one, uh, in, originates from the Near uh, East, uh, because it originates from the Judeo christian uh, civilization. Many of what we say is a Western civilization originates from the uh, knowledge that has for a long time been uh, kept in the Alexandria Library and the Arabs have taken to uh, the Catholic uh, Church. So if uh, the Arabs were not, then Aristotle would have been forgotten because they preserved his deeds and they knew uh, that the uh, lectures of Aristotle uh, got to the uh, Thomas Aquinsky during the Aquinsky. 
acquisition time. Many of the of the knowledge has been preserved in the near and is so uh, there is something that is called interdependence, interconnection, something that uh, would enable certain civilization to have influence on another civilization. So particularly that is the Balkans and also the Near East and the Gulf. There have been so many civilizations crossing this area that left so many traces that they have created something different than the other areas. Maybe similar to our two areas is the Caucasus. With one presentation uh, of 90 seconds, I will be able to present you the entire uh, imperial uh, civilization in the Near East, including the Balkans and part of the Gulf as well. So, you can follow the time uh, line uh, downstairs. It starts 3,000 years before Christ when uh, the uh, kingdom of Egypt was established. Then it comes the Hittites. Then we have the kingdom of Israel. Then uh, comes uh, the, the Assyrian uh, Empire. Then Babylon. The Persian Empire, then the Macedonian Empire, then comes the Roman Empire, then the Byzantian Empire as follower of the Roman Empire, then the Assassinates. Then the Caliphate emerged. The Seljuks. Then the Crusaders. The Saladin. Then the Mongolians emerged. And then this was followed by the Ottoman Empire, then the European colonization, and the period of the nation states, which is the 20th century, and the establishment of the new state of Israel after the Second World War in 1948. And in this time, uh, the, this empire, imperial history ends with independent states. What can we conclude? Uh, we have uh, not mentioned the Arab Spring and the uh, struggles in Syria, which are currently ongoing as conflict. What uh, can we conclude from this Im imperial history? The written history of uh, humankind is approximately 3,000 years. Uh, here we have also included the period before 3,000 years, uh, for which we have uh, myths and legends, but not uh, arguments. Uh, the argumented and documented facts of the human uh, history are in this period of 3,000 years. In uh, the period of 2,700 years, are uh, years of uh, war and conflict. Uh, the world, world, the world lived in peace only for three centuries. But here is the greatest paradox: uh, the longest periods of peace were in the Balkans, and we will uh, prove uh, this statement. We will have the opportunity to see the same animation of the history of the religions. We start with the oldest religions, which are uh, the Krishna with the emergement of uh, uh, Hinduism, then Abraham uh, was born, and the Judaism.
then the birth of Buddha in 480 and the spread of Buddhism, then the death of Jesus Christ in the uh, 32nd year and here we have the catacombs in the beginning and the conquer of the entire Roman Empire. Then the birth of Muhammad and the spreading of the Islam. And these are the conflicts which, uh, which emerged when uh, different religions got into certain content. Then the Crusaders. Here are the missionaries uh, who were active in uh, South, uh, um, in Latin America, in, Af in Africa, and also this is the today's picture of the religions in the world. So what can we uh, draw as a conclusion from the imperial history and from the history of religion? that we have always been captured by the perception of the world as it is today from this picture because we think that uh, the world has constantly been like that and that it will be in the future but uh, on the contrary the world is constant constantly changing uh, when we understand this dimension then we will uh, have a different uh, definition regarding the Balkans as well as the Middle East and the Gulf then we go back to the paradox that I mentioned, why there was a peace on the Balkans for the longest periods and why in the Middle East there are periods of peace where, when everywhere in the world there are conflicts. We have seen that the Balkans and the Gulf are places uh, where different civilizations are melting, uh, where different religions get into contact, which are changing constantly, which are not given as such. And this also contributed to, to having various uh, links and connections between different cultures and civilizations. Uh, in this regard, the civilizations are in interaction. And here are the uh, periods of peace which were in the Balkans and in the Middle East. Uh, they were called uh, Pax Romana and Pax Ottomana. We know that uh, Rome was an empire with a tyranny and it uh, had the power to impose peace. And the peace lasted from the period until the death of uh, Cleopatra when uh, August Octavian was conquered by uh, by Antonio uh, by the end of the uh, uh, death of the emperor philosopher Marcus Aurelius which was known as a period of uh, peace in the en entire uh, also, in the period, uh, uh, in the 16th and the 17th centuries, there was no war in the Balkans, which is known as Pax Ottomana. And this tradition is even present today in Macedonia. What is the reason for uh, lasting peace? Uh, we've uh, mentioned that the various empires uh, create a complexity of civilizations, cultures, uh, religions, and languages. Uh, the, this diversity when uh, is at open space, there is no conflict. Only the empire can open the space. Because when you open the space, you open people's minds. And people have the need to communicate with others. And that is how lingua franca or the communication code is established. So that they can establish communication between themselves. People with open minds have the need of competition. And that is how they create a market. And the market uh, has the need of a single currency. And all have the need of neutral power. 
that is the emperor during the Roman Empire and it is the Sultan during the Ottoman Empire having this role. Pax Romana left as a heritage something that is considered the foundation of the civil uh, human civilization which is known as the rule of law uh, through Justinian uh, who understood the role of uh, regulating the uh, relationship uh, between people uh, created corpus juris civilis and regulated all human rights and um, uh, privileges uh, in terms of family, property, ownership, uh, legacy, and uh, settled all the conflicts through the rule of law between people. That is, uh, how, that is why this was uh, regulated as a norm in order to prevent or regulate conflict if, if there is such. Uh, the legacy of the Ottoman Empire is uh, more substantial for our uh, region because the Ottoman Empire established a tradition of religious tolerance. So, that tradition is uh, evident in our space uh, that existed in the Balkans from the ancient times. There is different be difference between the policies which were in the Balkans and those policies in South uh, Italy, Greece and in other places. You can also find this in the attitude of Alexander when he went to the East and he merged uh, various cultures and some of the cultures or part of the culture brought to Europe. You will also find this in the influence uh, present and evident throughout uh, the entire period in our space. And we can define them as uh, uh, inheritance from the millet system and Komshi Kapijik philosophy. The millet system is a tradition that uh, was uh, launched with uh, the uh, Tsarigalat conquer and when the Sultan gave the right to the uh, Orthodox uh, Church, uh, uh, Catholics to have entire uh, rights um, and also this happens with the Jews when the Jews were expelled from Portugal and Spain and they arrived on uh, the Balkans and they also were given the right to have their own a religious community. The Armenians and the Georgians, because they have a separate church from the Orthodox, they also had their own millet. And along with the Islam or the Caliphate, uh, which uh, emerged later, there are four uh, millets. Uh, there were not so many researches uh, regarding the millet system and there are no in the western civilization so there are not so many definitions from the western civilization uh, however it uh, disguises the, uh, the, the the definition regarding the situation uh, in the Balkans in the Caucasus and in the Middle East as well the millet is a Persian word which was used by the Arabs for the entire period and it refers to what in the Western civilization uh, has the notion of nation. Um, however, the millet is a religious community. It is not an ethnic uh, community. And every millet has all the rights as the caliphate has. So it means they have religious leader and the religious uh, uh, leader is called Milad Bashi, which is a Turkish word, uh, who is uh, in, given this title if he uh, gives the Sultan 3,000 gold coins coins so then he has the barat and has and is entitled to uh, pay for those money from uh, his followers all uh, civil rights issues uh, are being regulated by the church with the church canon and uh, because the sultan both as a sultan as a caliph he implements the sharia on all uh, uh, on all uh, Muslims but he cannot do this to the Jews and to the Christians he allowed the, the Christians and the Jews uh, to respect their own uh, tradition and beliefs so the millet is a religious community enjoying all the rights but they have no territory this is for the first time in history that we have the notion of collective rights uh, by belonging to one certain millet you've been protected on the entire territory of the Empire and that's why during the Ottoman Empire, you could be uh, 
you could find uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Christians in Africa, you could also find Jews uh, in the Balkans, you, you could also find Jews in the Caucasus, you could also find Muslims in the Balkans, but also in Africa, in Asia. Uh, with the fact that you belong to certain millet, you are being protected. Uh, all those uh, believers who believed in God without ch having church, uh, that means that they did not need to have the intermediary between God and themselves. They were Islamized because the Ottoman Empire does not recognize any category as a non-believer. For the uh, Ottoman Empire, every citizen has to belong to certain community and uh, through that community to respect the rules of the empire. All those non-believers uh, were under the influence of the sects uh, from the Middle East or Asia, which are known as Qatari in Europe or Bogomils, and they all will Islamize so that they have uh, uh, to be accountable to certain personality. And that is how the religious tolerance emerged between all religious communities. As time was passing, there were influences from the West and uh, under the influence of France, uh, there was one Catholic millet which was established uh, for the Catholics within this empire. And under the influence of uh, Great Britain, the Protestant millet, millet was also established. All millets lived in tolerance. If uh, uh, there is a conflict or uprising or uh, threats uh, towards the Sultan within one millet, then the, the leader of the millet is accountable to the Sultan, which means he will be beheaded. And uh, then the population, the citizens had to collect more money so that they can appoint a new leader of their millet to the Sultan. That's why it is said that uh, Pax Ottomana is a result of despotism. And that's why it is also uh, uh, now that there was success uh, in uh, communities uh, which are mixed in terms of religion, language, and uh, uh, when the uh, French uh, uh, ideas came to the Balkans, who promoted the ideas uh, of a Balkan federation of uh, republics and the idea of sovereignty, uh, actually begins uh, the, the start of the collapse of this model of Pax Ottomana. Every ethnic uh, community uh, would like to have its own millet. And that is how the first Serbian uprising in the beginning of the 19th century emerged, which was unsuccessful. Then the second Serbian uh, uprising happened. Some of the uprisers went to the Peloponnese uh, so for the establishment of the new Greek state. And every new state uh, has to have its own church, uh, because in the Orthodox there is the principle of symphony. The church and the state live together and that's why within the Ottoman uh, Empire there is only one or Orthodox Church of all Orthodox uh, believers who were known as Romei and uh, uh, the Romei were also known as Rum and that's why their millet was known as uh, Rumeli and this is the community of all Orthodox Christians with the establishment of the new Greek state the Greek Church uh, separated from the ecumenical patriarch and has his own church and this uh, example would be followed by all new states in the Balkans. Every new state would establish its own uh, church. So first we had the, Bul the, the Bulgarian exarchy and then the Bulgarian principality. And then uh, we have the uh, Pitch uh, Patriarchy and then the Serbian state. Uh, so today's identities on the Balkans are actually result of the millets and that's why uh, they are religious identities in their background. Uh, example for that was the conflict in Bosnia so that we can understand the tradition out of it. Uh, in Bosnia, if you are Orthodox, then you are, Ch then you are Serb. If you are uh, Catholic, then you are Croat. But if you are Muslim, then you are a Bosniak. So you cannot be at the same time both Muslim and Croat, Catholic and Serb. So a synonym for a Serbian a personality is the Orthodox, and for the Bosniak is the Islam, and for the um, Catholic uh, Croat, uh, the last uh, uh, 
places where the military system was ruling. Even today you can be a Macedonian, Muslim, Macedonian, Orthodox, Macedonian, uh, Catholic, Albanian, Catholic, Alba Albanian, uh, Orthodox. Uh, exactly this tradition of the military system established Macedonia uh, in its uh, self, uh, its tradition and respect towards its model of tolerance, which is also uh, present even today. So, this tradition, uh, you can feel if you go in Kichava, for example, when you're in Macedonia and visit the monastery called Bogorodica Prečista, where even today you can find Muslims and Christians visiting this same uh, religious uh, facility and praying under the same roof. The part which is reserved from the Muslims is uh, has no icons and frescoes, but the part that uh, is uh, de dedicated for the Orthodox, there are churches, uh, there are frescoes and icons. And also it is being visited by the Sunnis and by the Orthodox. If you visit, for example, the monastery St. Nicola, which is Teke and an Orthodox uh, Christians, it is vis visiting by uh, Shia Muslims and by uh, the um, Orthodox. Uh, you can see at the same time there is a, a priest, uh, which is uh, Orthodox priest, and one Baba, which is Bektash uh, priest. Uh, also, if you go to uh, St. Jovan Bigger Siki in the vicinity of Debar, you will see that the Muslims are uh, present constantly in this monastery. Even a couple of years ago, when this uh, monastery went under fire, what you see here on the picture, picture was um, caught by fire. The first who came to uh, this to extinguish the fire were the Muslims uh, who came there with the mayor of Debar. If you visit Saint Naun, uh, which is a church monastery, even today you will see that uh, citizens from Albania, Muslims, come to this monastery and visit uh, this uh, Macedonian Muslims. Uh, who uh, live in the vicinity uh, of Ohri there, also present. So all this demonstrates that Macedonia uh, respects this tradition of religious tolerance. And it has this, uh, created people who are known for their let's call it tolerance. Uh, for example, uh, Mother Teresa, who was born in the center of the city of Skopje. Her uh, mother was an Albanian Catholic and uh, her uh, father was a Vlak. The house where Mother Teresa was born is surrounded with, pra uh, with Orthodox Church, then with the Catholic Church, with a uh, mosque and a synagogue on uh, the opposite side of the river Vardar. So uh, Mother Teresa, uh, in a radius of 50 meters, uh, was surrounded with, by all religions which were present at the time when she was born. And her tolerance and respect towards others, uh, merciness is expression of her life in the center of the city of Skopje. So, even today's Macedonian constitution, which has been amended after the conflict in 2001, expresses multi-ethnicism. So, Macedonia has been defined as a state of people, uh, citizens uh, of Macedonian origin, but also of Albanian people, Turkish people, Vlach people, Serbian people, the Roma people, the Bosniak and other people. So this is uh, in the preamble uh, for the definition of the state which encompasses its multi-ethnic uh, character. In the constitution, there is one rule that the official language of the state is the Macedonian language, but also the language of the community, which is being spoken by more than 20%, is also official language of the state. So, if there is one uh, area uh, which is populated uh, dominantly by Roma, then the mayor is Roma, but if uh, uh, there are 20% uh, 
percent uh, of Turkish minority in that uh, municipality, then also the Turkish language would be uh, official language. Uh, most probably, we are the only uh, country in the world where we have a mayor of uh, Roma origin, uh, having its uh, uh, primary, elementary, and secondary schools in Roma, NGO Roma, then uh, the language is Roma, uh, official gazette. So if, uh, for example, the majority of the population in certain part of Macedonia is uh, uh, Albanian, but if there is in that same municipality a um, Turkish minority of to more than 20%, then also Turkish language would be uh, official. This speaks of the multi-ethnic character and multi-religious character of the country. You will see that all the religions are mentioned in the constitution, the uh, Orthodox uh, Church, the, uh, the Catholic Church, the, uh, the, the um, Muslim uh, religion and the Jewish uh, confession. Although the majority uh, of the population is Orthodox uh, Christian in Macedonia, one of the former presidents of Macedonia was a Protestant. It was the president, the former president, Boris Trajkovsky. So it means that our reality reflects the tradition that has always uh, been present and influenced our reality. Also, you will be able to see the amendments that we have introduced to our constitution that the entire uh, heritage from the imperial history and the history of religions is as a model functional. That's why Macedonia has been the initiator under the presidency of former president uh, Trajkovsky in 2003 for the launching of the Forum of Dialogue Among Civilizations. This year we will be celebrating one decade of this uh, forum again in Macedonia. Can you imagine that in 2003 when uh, the conflicts on the Balkans were still felt, there was an initiative in Macedonia that enabled uh, uh, to uh, have the, such forums uh, um, held in every republic on the Balkan and to encourage dialogue among diversity. This has been uh, supported by UNESCO and the Council of Europe. Um, only the words, uh, the text of the declaration from Ohrid uh, depicts uh, the objective and uh, respect towards the heritage, uh, heritage for respecting diversity. Uh, so Macedonia is also initiator of the World Conference on Dialogue Among Religions and Civilizations. This year uh, we will organize the third World Conference which is attended by uh, religious leaders uh, from throughout the world and uh, we uh, demonstrate them the tradition of coexistence and uh, religious tolerance. So we came to the point that all these initiatives uh, that are being uh, organized in Macedonia is something that has always been present there. It is a tradition that has always been respected. And we are trying uh, through these initiatives uh, to point out that when you are part of democracy, then democracy has to be inclusive. It has to include diversity because there are cases in which democracy excludes diversity, which is basis for conflict. So uh, in a multi-ethnic uh, society, if you implement democratic model, then it has to be a model of integration without assimilation. So, when uh, you establish relations with your neighbors, they have to be founded on respect of diversity. So, if during uh, Roman uh, period there was Pax Romana and during the Ottoman Empire there was Pax Ottomana, we come to a period uh, when uh, Pax Europana is a possibility because only the European idea can again open the space and establish people with open minds. We've witnessed uh, what a single person on the Balkans with a closed mind could do and what the consequences were from Milosevic's reign.
Uh, also, the idea for an open space is idea that can only be offered to the Balkans by Europe. Only Europe can uh, establish again one market and also can establish a neutral power. What used to be Sultan and the Emperor, today it is the uh, Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Every citizen in the Balkans uh, can uh, file an application against its country to a neutral power as all uh, during the Ottoman Empire have addressed it as the last resort to the Sultan. The globalization has created that uh, uh, for the first time in history young people use one and the same language, it is the English language, so the open space virtually exists and there is the cooperation and communication, as I said, uh, enables for integration. Those who uh, do not communicate become part of ghetto, uh, they are isolated and they create uh, prejudice and stereotypes. Uh, as the European idea in the Balkans is perceived uh, such an idea is necessary for Middle East and for the Gulf as well. It should be an idea which is already respected by a younger generation because they uh, uh, listen to the same um, music, they watch the same movies, they rarely read but they read the same big books and uh, they uh, watch uh, worldwide um, uh, networks and TVs and use uh, the internet, Facebook and all the other uh, methods which are new but are meant for communication. So. We come to one uh, truth that every state as the greatest treasure in the world is in its uh, citizens. If uh, we invest in education of people and if we uh, enable them communication and if we enable them to have tolerance uh, for the others and if uh, the other one is respected, you should expect uh, respect from uh, the others, then we have period of uh, peace. Conflict is a lack of communication and dialogue is the lack of respect for the others. Is uh, result of intolerance towards the tradition and the habits and customs of the others. We live in a world in which the life is so swift and uh, time is leaking away so quickly. And that's why everyone says, how have I spent my life before he dies? And then we recollect of the wisdom of our predecessors who taught us that we should uh, respect what we have and not to cherish for what we do not have. When we respect what we have, we will uh, have it and we will uh, have uh, even a, a, an attitude towards it for as a protector. If uh, we uh, go for what we do not have, then we might be uh, in conflict with those who have what we the desire to have and we still do not have. I think that this was enough. I think that uh, uh, I have provoked uh, further discussion and debate among you. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, His Excellency is kindly agreed to engage with you for a little while. So, any questions, um, remarks kept brief will give us plenty, plenty of time to get a little bit of engagement. So, I think there should be a um, there should be a microphone floating about. Okay. Mr. President, thank you for your uh, speech, uh, lecture. Uh, I have a question regarding Gulf-Macedonian relationships. How important is Qatar to Macedonia and uh, how, is, uh, how are Qatar Macedonian relationships uh, uh, strategic or 
what are the terms of the relationships between Qatar and Macedonia? Both Qatar and Macedonia are two small countries. Both Macedonia and Qatar are small countries, and small countries understand each other better in terms of understanding small countries and big countries. So it means that Macedonia is in the Balkans where there used to, uh, where, where there is uh, so much history and very little geography. And also Qatar is a place where there were so many conquerors, invaders, foreign colonies, let's call them occupiers, both Portugal, British, uh, Persian uh, and some other civilizations uh, since we are faced with a small area in comparison to other countries which are big countries we as small countries we should not uh, look for a physical expansion of the country we as country we, we as countries we should uh, grow in height so that we can establish people with the highest qualities people with uh, uh, highest capacity for inventing uh, new ideas, products and friendships. So, as small countries, we can uh, prove today our uh, greatness because in the Internet there are no limits, no boundaries. Respecting our culture, tradition, and demonstrating our identity, our specificity, we will be able to find similar to us. And that is the idea of uh, His Highness uh, who supported the Alliance of Civilizations. That is our idea for dialogue among civilizations. Because every conflict would not appear if there is dialogue, if there is communication, talks, and if we find a way for a joint position for certain issues that we have uh, dissenting opinions. And that's why we feel that Macedonia, with the establishment of the economic cooperation with Qatar and with the culture cooperation, these days we discussed about cooperation in uh, higher education in the area of tourism. Uh, we would be able to establish close uh, relations of uh, trust and confidence and then we will communicate and we will uh, present ourselves to third parties as countries that can offer certainties and we can offer our model of integration without assimilation, our amendments to the constitution that uh, go for inclusive democracy, you can uh, offer vision how to invest in young people through Qatar Foundation, which enabled you to have such uh, universities which are prominent in the world to be present in the Gulf, and where you can share your knowledge, experience, vision and ideas with others. Good evening, one great welcome to our president. I'm Dr. Susanna. I've been working for two months here in Qatar and I have a message from my director of the clinic, Mr. Hassan, to greet you. He was prevented to come here and attend your uh, lecture. You also, he sent greetings to you and uh, his message was uh, to continue the cooperation between Macedonia and Qatar. There are many outstanding issues, but also open doors for our young people to come here and be educated here and also if there is possibility uh, the relations between Qatar and Macedonia uh, for a direct uh, flight line so not to use uh, different uh, uh, places, but a direct flight line from Skopje to Doha, and he wished pleasant stay here and also to the uh, delegation and greetings to the ambassador of the Republic of Macedonia. 
Thank you. I already had talks with the, the president of the CEO of uh, um, Qatar Airways, and there are pre uh, preparations uh, regarding opening a direct flight from uh, Doha to Skopje for the next year. We they are uh, uh, surveying all the uh, possibilities, as no, and most pro pro probably next year there will be a direct flight. And for the exchange of students, uh, you know, before becoming president I was a professor and again I will be a professor and in order to keep up with this as a president I established the uh, project the so-called uh, school of leaders so I would offer you one or two best students from this university graduated who are at a master program uh, can come and attend the school of young leaders uh, which is uh, being uh, uh, the hub of the greatest the British, US and from all other parts of the world uh, professors where we train them to be leaders but not leaders in politics only in all areas we need people who uh, have the capacity and the ability to be leaders that is what we taught them at our uh, school of young leaders again the same way President, um, it's so it's a privilege for you for me to be here to listen to your um, speech. Um, the Macedonian Constitution and indeed the United Nations community believe that democracy should be inclusive of all ethnicities. Um, in the Macedonian Constitution, you've highlighted that there are many official languages. Um, so we tolerate everyone. However, considering that there are so many languages, doesn't how would this affect economic activity and the ease of communication? Every community has to have a communication code. The language in a multi-ethnic society is not only origin of the identity, but is a communication code. So it means that in Macedonia, Macedonian language is communication code for communication between different linguistic groups. In the past, our predecessors were capable of speaking several languages depending on the area they were involved in. Those who were occupied with uh, with cattle breeding, they knew the Vlach language because the cattle breeding was part of the Vlach community. Those who were dealing with trade uh, knew and spoke the Greek language because it was the language of the traders and merchants. Those who were uh, active in uh, handicrafts, uh, they knew certain language. But however, lingua franca at that time was the Turkish language. In former Yugoslavia time, uh, we had one lingua franca, which was the serbo croatian language. In today's in present Macedonia, every uh, young uh, people is uh, capable of speaking English. So uh, young people are educated to, um, uh, to know and speak uh, mother tongue, to be educated in mother tongue, to have the possibility to uh, go to higher education in mother tongue, but the uh, language that unites all is the Macedonian language and in future, as citizens of the world, we will uh, all speak English. And in this part of the world, Arabic language. In Asia, Chinese language. And the civilizations have established their own communication codes, but the globalization creates its own code. And it is the English language that has no uh, strict um, grammar rules. It is mostly used for uh, communication and not for writing poetry. It's working. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. President, Your Excellency. I'm Ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much for the enlightening lecture and uh, the fact that your position on, on cooperation and, and tolerance uh, gave us a little bit more courage. Uh, please, what is 
uh, your position today in Macedonia regarding the European integration and NATO and uh, what is your position uh, how the, the debt integration not only on Macedonia but the other countries West Balkan countries how it will uh, look like in the future and will the possible European integration with NATO will bring stability in the future for the region thank you very much I've mentioned that the European idea for the Balkans is even greater than uh, for the other candidate countries. The European idea for the Balkans is again uh, to restore peace. Because the European idea itself is a peace project. And that's why all those who live in the Balkans hope that with the integration uh, in the European Union, uh, the Peace will come in the Balkans. It doesn't mean prosperity or what the ordinary citizens uh, think that everything will be changed and the life will be easier. With the European Union, we have European standards, values and principles that we have to implement. Uh, but when all these principles are, are respected, then the citizens have a legal certainty, secure future and uh, willingness for pursuit of happiness. So uh, the uh, space will be open, the market will be open, and the possibility for success is open. Uh, as long as we are kept outside of that open space, we are uh, exposed to mutual conflicts, mistrust, intolerance. And that's why I said that the message from the past is that peace would come when uh, the space is open. Bosnia is uh, the greatest uh, witness of uh, the life in an open space and when Bosnia as I said and as the former uh, president said uh, Izadbekovic was a tiger skin uh, it was not important to what ethnic community you belong but that you respect each other that tradition of let's call it of the Milad system of religious tolerance disappeared with the conflict in Bosnia when the identities uh, became territorial. And in multi-ethnic, multi-religious and multilingual society, when you say this belongs to me, then this would be a reason for a conflict. In a multi-ethnic, multi-religious and multilingual societies, there is no nothing that is mine. It is ours, as it is proven by the tradition of the Muslims and the Christians in one uh, visiting one uh, same uh, religious object. It is ours. Then we establish the consciousness of us as the uh, U.S. Constitution uh, begins, we, the people. And here lies the idea of Europe, uh, the one that is offered and expected from Europe. Because we know that the situation in terms of economy in Europe is not great. We know that there are so many conflicts uh, uh, um, uh, regarding the diversity, the Islam, the refugees. But however, the idea is very, very great because it would bring peace. Because uh, the peace is the most valuable thing in the human history. No one respects peace when there is peace. Uh, you can ask them in Syria what means, uh, what peace means for them. And that's why we've learned a great lesson, a moral one in the Balkans, that uh, in the Balkans, uh, in the 20th century, we had two Balkan wars, two world uh, wars. We had the Cold War and the hot, uh, you know, hot peace uh, after the collapse of Yugoslavia. It is time the Balkans live in peace. And this uh, state, uh, we see it only through Europe. And that's why Europe is the one that can offer future to the Balkans. And that's why NATO as structure of that future, however, we need to provide infrastructure to have peace. That's why we believe that NATO is uh, an umbrella under which all of us can be hidden. Security and when security uh, is present, we will be prosperous. Europe uh, uh, went through many crises and it got out of those crises. However, young generations should believe more in the European future. Because, I will repeat, 
European, uh, the European Union received the uh, Nobel Peace Prize because it is a synonym of peace and that's why we need more Europe in the Balkans. And that's why we do everything to have to be Europeans because Europe will come in the Balkans when in the Balkans Europeans will live who will respect the European standards European criteria and European principles and all the reforms that we implement in the Balkans we do not do for Brussels but we do for us for our people so that when they uh, appear in front of a court the court they know that that the uh, judgment would be respected by all when it goes goes to the cadastre then uh, and has his property uh, claimed then that is his uh, property and when uh, we conclude certain agreement we know that that uh, the rules from that agreement are, are being respected that's the answer for this question I, th I think I, I know I saw another few hands up but I'm afraid that his excellency has already given us more time than, uh, than had been planned I, I'm not sure if you are clearly still willing indeed so a couple of short interventions please your excellency uh, thank you very much for coming uh, here today it's a privilege uh, to have you with us uh, my name is Dimitri Sardellis I'm a student here at Georgetown and I am from Greece uh, by closely studying the dispute between uh, the two countries uh, I understand what it means uh, to you to be a Macedonian and understand how essential it is for all your identity, as I am sure you understand how essential it is uh, for the Greek identity. At a time when uh, consensus and collaboration is necessary between the two countries uh, in order to finally resolve this issue, I wanted to ask uh, why has your country resorted to using uh, historical references uh, which have Greek origins, such as Alexander the Great, Philip II, uh, you've been using these references for your airport, hospitals, and so on. How do such actions help uh, resolve the dispute? And what are your goals and your purposes um, behind such actions? Thank you. Regarding the relations between Macedonia and Greece, there are so many different opinions. Some think that we are at the verge of a war. However, if we consider the reality between the two societies, there are no problems. All Macedonians spend their summer vacations in Greece. According to the Greek statistics, last year, the first six months of 2012, Macedonians uh, spent uh, 550 million euros in the Greek economy. In Macedonia, uh, there are more than 200 uh, Greek companies. Only the first six uh, ranking companies two years ago in Macedonia, according to the Macedonia stati statistics, uh, have uh, made an income of 770 million euros. Every weekend in Thessaloniki you will find Macedonian citizens assisting the Greek economy by spending money in Greek stores, in tourism and in uh, trade. If you visit any uh, town in the southern part of Macedonia, uh, on a daily basis you will find Greek citizens because the food, the services in Macedonia are cheaper. So this speaks that the societies have no problem. Maybe among the older generations there was uh, stereotypes and uh, prejudice from the civil war in Greece when the Macedonians supported the Greek uh, left uh, wing. And uh, let's not go into uh, history, uh, but that generation is already gone. There is a new generation without uh, pre uh, pre uh, prejudice. And an ambience of confidence and trust is being established. This uh, confidence uh, existed in the past as well. Can you imagine one certain example I will mention? The most famous uh, Greek in the world is uh, uh, Zorba the Greek. Zorba the Greek uh, spent his uh, last uh, 20 years of his life in Skopje. You can find his uh, grave even today in Skopje. His family and relatives still live in Skopje because the space was open and people used to communicate. 
And regarding the names and the entitlements, Macedonia is a member of UNESCO. We've been obliged to preserve the entire heritage found on our territory to nurture and protect and promote it. We are not guilty that part of ancient Macedonia is on the present territory of the Republic of Macedonia, as it is part on the Greek territory. It is an inheritance of the human civilization. It is not an inheritance of one single state. We are not to be blamed because the mother of uh, Philip, uh, the grandmother of uh, Alexander the Great, was born in today's Bitola. And in her uh, honor, Philip built the uh, town called Heraclea. And in, uh, there is a monument uh, in his honor in Bitola, which is known as Philip, also as the city uh, which bear the name of Philip, which is Filipoli in Bulgaria, there is a huge monument of Philip in this city. But uh, we have not uh, seen a single Greek politician uh, to make remarks to the Bulgarians why they use the name of Philip and uh, erect a monument of Philip in Bulgaria. In the uh, United States there are approximately 10 uh, cities which are called Macedonia and which have been established by Macedonians who used to live in Greece and went to the United States. Uh, their uh, successors uh, live today in these cities and respect the name of their city. So Macedonia is not only a state, it is much more, it is a heritage, a culture, a tradition. Macedonian in the history used to be a person who was open-minded, prepared to receive and to share uh, with others, not to keep something for uh, himself. You know, in the history of the ancient period, in the Byzantine time, the Macedonian dynasty, they were not from Macedonia, but they were from Thrace, and also in the period of the Ottoman Empire, and um, during the Balkan Wars, the Macedonians uh, built the feeling, the sense of belonging according to that tradition. To be Macedonians means to be cooperative, to be open to receive and to share with others. We uh, rejoice that in Greece there are people who consider themselves to be Macedonians. But they should be Macedonians, first of all, to be open, to be communicative and to seek for solutions. So. Many of the issues which are between the two countries have been created by the politic by the political elites and not by the citizens because the citizens communicate and respect each other. I've, I have sent four times uh, my Greek counterpart uh, to come and drink coffee, but he rejects my invitation. He does not want to meet me. I'm constantly, uh, I've uh, constantly spent my summer vacations in Greece. Uh, my son goes even today there. I envy him because I love uh, Thessaloniki, Athens. I was a visiting professor at Kapodistria University. I have so many friends and colleagues, but uh, the politics needs poli political mobilization for voters because it is very easy to mobilize voters if you find one very sensitive issue which uh, has the capacity to mobilize more voters. Uh, so for a certain peri period, the political elites uh, need certain issue to, that would bring uh, more voters. However, this issue has been so complicated that it has blocked us in terms of our accession to NATO and the European Union. So if there is dialogue, if there is communication, certainly there will be a solution. And if uh, some uh, future generation would see that we've spent 20 or even 30 years, we don't know when the end of this issue will come, they will ask us, why have you spent time on such an issue? So this is something that is a legacy that we need to respect. People that live in the area of Macedonia have preserved the name Macedonia. And as you can see, uh, in the ancient period we have Epirus, uh, Trasi, Thessaly, 
uh, but uh, they as uh, identities have uh, disappeared. But the people who used to live in the area of Macedonia uh, from generation to generation transfer that uh, sentiment that the name Macedonia should be respected. Indeed, the name Macedonia is, does not uh, uh, come from the Balkans. Uh, today there is internet and if you go uh, in, and use the Google Translate um, tool and use any language and write uh, the world of the modern, uh, for example in Greek, Cosmos Matelo, and if you translate it into Hindu and listen its pronunciation, you will hear Macedonia. So it means uh, that this name was given by all civilization. You've seen how many old civilization have crossed our territory. They uh, have uh, understood that in that area there was the mother. And not only the name of Macedonia, but also if you write down uh, sun, you will hear Syria. So it's again from the Hindu origin. This is something that has been left to us as a legacy that we have to preserve and protect. We cannot deprive ourselves of that. Absolutely, thank you very much indeed. Um, I know now we've gone way over uh, the time you had originally allotted to us, so I think we're going to have to call it a, a night at this point. There is um, a little reception outside, so please uh, come and mingle and partake. Uh, but once again, many thanks to you, and, and uh, as I said, we hope it's not the last time. <laughs>